it's recording right yeah okay uh, so this is the fourth lecture for today and um, first time we had talked about the probability laws second time i think we talked about conditionals third one we talked about independence today uh, we are going to take a back foot and start with more basics but we will introduce some big concepts for the day uh, which will form the crux of the entire course from this moment so i will be talking very briefly about 15 minutes for counting like how do you count basic things uh, what does it mean what does counting mean what permutations combinations mean what is binomial distributions how do they look like when you plot them and then uh, we are going to talk about discrete random variables so basically what is a random variable what does it mean for it to be discrete what does it mean for it to be continuous and once you have that set up in place then uh, you can plot it and then if you are given a general distribution how do you get some statistics about it uh, like expectations and variances and when you plot a random variable you make a small curve called the pmfs Uh, which is nothing but probability mass functions so uh, i have basically combined lectures 4 and lecture 5 of mit ocw so uh, i will be spending up more time on the second part but if the first part is not clear then you guys can go back and look at the original lectures they are pretty much better far better than me so there is that okay so so then so when i am starting i am just so like the best way to understand counting is through a question so the question is like this that uh, there are five people in a room and there are five chairs present and you want to understand so you have a chair so you have these chairs here and uh, these five chairs are labeled c1 c2 c3 c4 and c5 and you have five people standing in a line and you are interested so uh, so these five people will sit on either of these five chairs so a person can sit on only one chair and all of these five chairs will be filled by all of these five people so you are interested in knowing what is the number of ways in which uh, all these five people can sit on all these five chairs so uh, the way we go about that is that if you look at this chair if you look at this slot so then at this slot uh, all of these five people can go right at at this chair all the five people can sit so so here five people can sit and once one of the people has sat here so for example p2 guy has sat sat here so then uh, on the four people remain and these four people can sit at these places so either of these four people can sit at these places right so uh, then it means that four people can sit here and then let's say someone of this sat and then three people remain and these three can go to this slot so uh, so essentially it's nothing it's just multiplication of the values so here you can see it comes out 12 24 and 5 Uh, 24 times 5, I think, is a 120. So, uh, the number of ways in which five people can go in these five slots is nothing. Just five into four into three into two into one. So you take the number of people, which is five, and keep on multiplying the number five and multiply by five minus one, multiply by five minus two, so on till one. Okay. So the important point here is that the number of chairs. Are equal to the number of people, so that's the number of ways. So suppose there were n people. So let's say instead of five, there were n people. So there were n chairs and there were n people. So then uh, here n people could go. Here n minus one people could go. N minus two and so on till one. So the number of ways in which n people could sit in these n chairs. would have been n multiplied by n minus 1 so on n minus 2 so on till 1 and this notation in mathematics is known as a factorial which is nothing which is a n factorial okay and the way we denote factorial is in two ways either by a exclamation mark or make a small chair and put n on the base okay so uh, this is the thing 
so for example there was for example there were 10 um, <coughs> for example there were 10 people so then the number of ways in which they could sit would have been 10 factorial okay so uh, there is that uh, okay so this formula is counting the arrangements of all the people in this Okay, so for example, there were three slots and I take three people, P1, P2, P3. So then three times two times one is a six. And if I make the combinations in which they can sit, is essentially there are six combinations. So you can see there are six ways in which these three people can sit in these three chairs. So the number of unique people, like this is only the arrangement of all these people. So here like the number of unique people are P1, P2 and P3, okay. So this formula is not counting the uniqueness, it's only counting the total number of arrangements. The number of ways in which three people could sit in all of these three chairs, okay. So uh, that is the thing. So uh, is this clear? Okay, Nathan, is this clear? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then, what naturally follows is a concept of restricted permutations. What happens in restricted permutations is that I am pretty now I am being clever. So what happens is that you go to the your semester has begun. And there is one course which you pretty much like to take. Uh, so let's say that I am teaching this course in next semester and there were 40 chairs and only 20 of you guys. So obviously that would have meant for uh, the other 20 chairs were left. So I reduced the number of chairs from 20 to 10. So as to say, so as to feel that, so as to give the illusion that my course is very popular because only 20 only 10 of you guys will get the chairs and the rest will have to stand. So I will say that I'm very popular. So let's say that number of chairs are lesser than the number of people. Okay, so here we have five, uh, here we have five people again. So P1, P2, P3, P4, P5. And here we have three chairs. And now we are interested in answering the question that what is the number of possible ways in which five people could be distributed among these three chairs. Okay, so so like the idea is that at a moment only three people can sit on these chairs and two people will be left standing and the three people who are sitting on these chairs will distribute among themselves in different possible ways, right? So um, if I look at this chair, so how many people can sit here? Like at this place, any of these five people can go, right? So five. And, and so if one person has already went, then the number of people left are four, and number of chairs left are two, and I'm looking at the second chair. So here, um, out of the four people, any of the four people can go here. So, which is four, multiplied by four, and then three people are left and only one chair. So here, any of the three people can go, right? So here, if you compare this with the previous case in which there were five chairs, I had multiplied it from 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 and here it only goes on till the 3, right? So this is an example of restricted permutation uh, in which what happens is that the number of chairs are less than the number of people who are present, okay? So uh, if you look at this guy, uh, so in a general mathematical term, so here like the answer would have been 60. Right, which is fine. Earlier we had gotten a 120 answer, which was because there were many chairs, but now the chairs are less. So there is a lesser ways in people in which people can sit. You can see it's a factor of two by which it has decayed. So uh, once this is done, then what remains is how to make it a, in a general framework. So let's say that there are n people. So Let's say that there are n people. So, and there are r chairs. And here the number of chairs are less than n, right? Number of chairs are less than the number of people. 
so uh, the number of ways in which the persons can go to first slot is n and number of ways in which they can go to second slot is n minus 1 and so on n minus 2 and so and this whole thing has to be r years right so the last term in this has to be r minus 1 right so it's n minus r minus 1 because i'm starting from a zero here n minus 0 okay so it's a product of n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 and so on till n minus r plus 1 because these two minus terms will give the product okay so it's n n minus 1 n minus 2 on so on till n minus r plus 1 and it can be written in a simpler format how uh, if i multiply this entire term by the continuous sequence if i take keep on multiplying it by uh, subtracting one factor so let's say i am taking uh, i am multiplying this numerator and denominator by by n minus r yeah so n minus r n minus r minus 1 and so on till 1 divided by this whole thing which is again here n minus r minus 1 and so on till 1 so you can see that the upward thing starts from n goes till 1 right which is nothing but n factorial divided by this thing starts from n minus r and goes on till 1 which is n minus r factorial okay so uh, this is the number of ways in which people can be distributed so for our example we have the people who are 5 uh, so num the n was 5 and the number of chairs were 3 so it would have been 5 minus 2 factorial which is 5 factorial by 3 factorial which is 5 into 4 into 3 factorial by 3 factorial which gives us a 20 okay uh, did I make some mistake? we have to 5 minus the number of chairs 5 into 4 so it would be like 5 minus 3 and then it would be 5 minus 3 and then 2 factorial um, so there are five there are five people divided by five minus two which is three factorial which is five and four by three by three factorial which comes out to give a twenty. Shouldn't it be five minus three then? Hmm? Shouldn't it be five minus three since r is three? Oh r is three? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, so this is a two factorial which comes I'm so sorry. I'm just looking for my back with that. Yeah. Know. Five into four into three, which comes out to be sixty. Okay, which is pretty much the same answer which we have gotten. So, yeah. So this is the example of a restricted permutation, which is equivalent to taking out of n set a smaller subset of size r, where the formula reduces to n factorial upon n minus r factorial, uh, and it talks about all the arrangements of r people which is the number of chairs among themselves okay so think of it like this you take n set so you think of this uh, in graphical terms as like this you take n people you choose a group of r you choose a group of r people among them and those r people go to sit on the chairs and the number of ways in which they can sit is basically n factorial upon n minus r factorial okay so this is the most, most general form, uh, format of such nature. Okay, now the other question which we would like to ask ourselves is how to derive the choose operator. So what does choose operator mean? The choose operator means this. Suppose I tell you that there are 100 people in a class and I ask you to take I ask you that how many different combinations of people are possible uh, like how many different combination of 20 size people are possible okay so like you you are looking at 
let's say that you are looking at 100 people and you are interested in choosing a smaller set of 20 people out of those. Maybe you want to, um, yeah, so you are interested in choosing the smaller set of 20 people. So here the arrangement is not necessary, right? You are just choosing the people out of n things. So what I mean to, uh, what I mean for choosing is like this. I have these three pens and I want to choose two out of these. So either I choose these two pens or I choose these two pens or I choose these two pens, right? But if once I have chosen these two pens, whether they are arranged like this or they are arranged like this, it doesn't matter to me. Okay? I'm interested in only choosing them. Maybe I want to do something for that. So there, let's say that there is a magical operator which does that. Okay? We don't know what it is, but we want to derive it. So what we do know should be enough for letting us derive that particular operator. Okay? So let's start with the problem which we have already discussed that we had n people who were sitting, n people who were outside the classroom and there was a chair, there were R chairs which were present. Okay? So there were R chairs uh, on which they had to, on which um, out of those n R people could have come and they could have sit on those R chairs and distributed themselves, right? So we found that that answer was n factorial upon n minus r factorial, okay? So now let's imagine that what should be the properties of this choose operator if we manage to make this. So the properties of choose operator would be that out of n people, I sometimes, somehow I choose r people and I manage to choose that I don't know how. So then the problem reduces that there are only r people and r people are to be distributed among the r chairs, okay? So I choose some things and then the number of ways in which the R people can distribute among R chairs is R factorial which is equivalent to the first case which we talked about when number of chairs is equivalent to number of persons, okay? So let's say that there is a magical choose operator where you choose, you don't know what that formula is, maybe you call that choose and out of that choose, once you apply that operator to set up N people then you end up with a group of size R and from that R size group, the problem reduces to that R people are to distribute among R chairs. So then the number of ways in which R people can choose or can distribute among R chairs is R factorial by the first argument that when I had told that there were N chairs and people, so here there are R chairs and R people. So they could have distributed in R factorial ways. So this and this should be equal, right? With the both arguments. So if I do the choose operator and I apply a R factorial to it, then it should be equivalent to this, right? So this R factorial goes to this, this term and this gives you the definition of choosing the R operators, okay? So what does this mean? This means that out of 10 people, I am interested in choosing two people subsets, okay? So maybe out of these three three pens, I was interested in choosing two subsets. So you saw there were only three such ways, right? These two, these two, and these two, right? So, so here the number of ways in which I could have chosen them, n would have been three, and, the, uh, and I'm choosing two size subsets, so my r is two, two factorial, two factorial, and n minus, 3 is 3 minus 2 factorial, which is nothing but 3 factorial by 2 factorial, which is a 3, okay? So you get the number of possible ways to choose two elements from the subset, from a bigger set of three elements, which is 3, okay? Uh, and if I had asked you a different question that these three pens are there, in how many ways can they arrange themselves? So there would have been six ways, those six things which I had written here, okay? So that formula would have been just 3 factorial because 3 places and 3 pens. So that is the thing. So the way you understand permutations and combinations is you start with an n sized subset, n size bigger set. You apply the choose operator to choose a smaller set of size r and then those r things can permute among themselves in r factorial ways which is equivalent to this formula which gives you the definition of the choose operator. Okay. Uh, any any doubt? What? Any doubt? Uh, no. 
So then I have a question for you. Uh, so this one we have already come with this one we have already covered that this this entire term can be written in a compact form as n choose r, which means that out of n bigger set I can choose a smaller set of r size. And the way this formula is expanded is nothing. It's this same way, okay? And then uh, we have also talked about that you can choose R items and you can order them in R factorial ways, and that essentially is equivalent to this formula which we had derived earlier, n factorial upon n minus R factorial, okay? So when you equate them, then you get the same formula, okay? So now. I am asking you a smaller a smaller question. You see this expression? N choose 0. So N choose K and K varies from 0 to N. What do you think this should be? Can you tell me what is what is the meaning of this expression? Okay, so first of all, I don't feel I mean feel we saw like with no shares, so they're like no combinations to to be done. Okay. That, uh, there, I mean, groups like say groups. Then I want to choose one group mm -hmm. of use one person. Okay. Then I, I sound like all the combinations of groups of two persons that I can okay. make up to one. Mm -hmm. That's all the sum. That's so right. basically, what I'm basically what we are trying to do is that let's say that we have three people. So this thing is n choose 0 plus n choose 1 plus n choose 2 and so on till n choose n. So like n choose 0 means that out of n things you have chosen no one. Okay. How many ways can you choose no one? One way, right? And then nc1 means out of n people you have chosen only one people. So I choose you, 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 you are three people, right? So there are three ways to choose you out of. So, uh, so if you have a set, let's say p1, p2, p3 then what you're basically doing is constructing a smaller sized subsets out of this set and what you are counting is the number of subsets right so like the number of subsets of this would have been an empty set p1 p2 and p3 so these are three sets of one size each this is a zero size set and this is the two size set right And uh, when you take all the three, then it's only one set, right? So how many of the sets you have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? So there are total eight ways in which I can construct all the possible subsets of this bigger set. So what does it mean? So how can I solve, how can I find the number of subsets of a bigger set? A uh, algebraic person would take this expression and sum it blindly from all the k's and apply some sort of complicated maths to it, right? But, but how can you get a formula intuitively through your understanding? Huh? How can you get a formula for this? I mean, intuitively through your understanding. Oh, intuitively? Yeah. So, so the idea is this: that if any, so if I construct a set. In that set, any of these elements can either go or not go, right? So, like, I can imagine the set is a chair, and on this chair, either this P person P1 can sit or cannot sit. So, he has two choices. And similarly, P2 can sit or not sit at this place. And similarly, P3 can sit or not sit at this place. So, imagine nobody sits, it's equivalent to this, right? So it's essentially that every person has a two choices of whether to be present in the set or set or, or to not be present. So these n people can either be there, but when I multiply them, I'm taking all the possible combinations, which is nothing but 2 raised to power n. Right? So here it was 3, so total there were 8 possible subsets. So this is why probabilities are good, that they allow you to interpret complex formulas in terms of arrangements. Okay. So, like, can you uh, put that expression like in the summation and get to the to them? Like, yeah, the I, right can. I can. I can. So, you want me to do that? If you want to? <laughs> yeah, I will. Be, I would like to. Okay, you guys are familiar with binomial theorem. I am. You are familiar. So it's pretty simple then. 
1 plus x to the power n is written as summation of ncr times x raised to the power r, right? Going from 0 to n. Put x as 1. Okay, again. Okay. Done? Uh -huh. Cool. So, uh, so that is the thing uh, what, what I wanted you to understand. That combinations taken sums is equivalent to a chair, a chair analogy for this sort of system. Okay. Cool. I am just going to do one last problem for the uh, counting case. I will solve it in front of you so that you know how to count. Okay. So I am playing a game with you guys. We have 52 cards and we are four players. Okay. So uh, we are four players and I deal. 13 cards to me, 13 to him, 13 to him, 13 to him, okay? And I'm interested in calculating the probability that an ace goes to each of us. So like I can distribute all the 52 cards, 13, 13 at a time in any possible ways. And the ace can either come all four to me, right? I'm interested in counting the experiments in which one ace goes to each of us, okay? So how do we do such sort of things? So we know that this probability, so have you understood the problem? That we are dealing 14 cards, we are dealing 52 cards. A 52 cards has 13 cards of different colored suits and there are four separate aces of different colors, right? So all the four A's are going to different people and all the other remaining cards, 52 minus four, which is 48 cards can be distributed in any particular fashion but the sum of cards which I get should be 13 so and you should also get 13 cards you are interested in calculating the probability that an ace goes to each of us okay so so then the problem to solve like the way we solve this problem is first let's find the number of total experiment the total outcomes the total outcomes are that uh, given 52 cards in how many ways can I get it into groups of 13 cards, right? 13 cards, 13 cards, 13 cards, 13 cards. And I can assign the groups to you guys. How many ways are possible for that? So uh, it's pretty easy, right? So let's say that uh, out of 52 cards, first I choose a group of 13 cards and I keep them on the side. 13 cards here, 13 cards here, 13 cards here, 13 cards here, okay? So I make a group of 13 cards and I put them, those 13 cards in the group, okay? And then uh, four of us are standing and we can go to any of those groups, right? So let's say that there are 13 cards in this group, 13 cards in this group, 13 cards in this group, and 13 cards in this group. So we can, if we manage to put them in these groups, then the problem is for four of us, which of the slots can go here, right? So I can choose and either of these, you can, if I have chosen this, then you have to choose out of the remaining three, right? So, so how do I do this problem? So the idea is simple that out of 52 cards, first I choose 13 cards, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, what remains is 52 minus 13, which is, uh, yeah, which is 39 cards remain, right? And out of 39 cards, I choose 13 cards again. And out of remaining 26, I choose 13 cards again. Mm -hmm. And finally, I choose out of remaining 30, I choose 13 cards again, right? So by now, the cards are in their own groups, right? But the cards in a particular group can distribute among themselves. That doesn't matter to us, right? So this group, even if it shuffles, it still goes to me. But it's shuffling is equivalent to me. We, will, I, we can't remember like the last group since it's like... Yeah, like, that's fine. But keep yeah. it for the... Brevity. So these 13 cards can distribute among themselves. You get that? So 13 factorial, 13 factorial, 13 factorial, 13 factorial, right? So it's 13 factorial raised to the power 4. Okay? So these are the ways in which um, I am able to form the groups of four 13 cards each. And uh, I have considered all the possible combinations. Now the problem is that these 13 cards have to be distributed to four of us, right? So any of the groups of four cards could be assigned to us, right? So uh, four groups, four people, how many ways can those be assigned the groups? Four factorial ways, right? 
So this guy gets multiplied by an additional 4 factorial. So this entire thing is the total number of outcomes for this expression. Okay? And if you solve this, this should be equivalent to that. Okay? Yeah. How big is that number? <laughs> yeah, you were saying something. Um, I was wondering why you multiplied by 13 factorial to the fourth, because should order matter for the 13 Yeah, it doesn't matter. The order doesn't matter. Okay. What I'm trying to say, even if I solve this problem with order, the order of, of okay. the numerator and denominator will still cancel out. Yeah. Okay? So you could remove this guy. Doesn't matter. We are right. Uh, and uh, the number of ways in which you could distribute four aces is simple. You have four aces with you. So four aces can go to each of us in four factorial ways, right? Four aces can go to, so we have these four aces. And four, so this is the total number of outcomes and we are now interested in counting the remaining outcomes. So four aces can go to four of us in 16 ways, which is four factorial ways. And then what remains is, uh, out of 52 cards, 48 cards remain. And from 48 cards, those are to be distributed equally among us. So remaining 12 cards have to go to each of us. Okay? So it is equivalent to out of 48, choosing 12 cards. Okay? So you can see that this thing is getting multiplied by a 4 factorial. And I had a 4 factorial here. These two 4 factorials are cancelling each other out. So it's this factor remaining with this factor here. Okay? Cool. Uh, okay. Uh, I took more time to So let's start with the let's start with the easier topic for now. Um, this was for the counting and counting is pretty tricky unless you get a hang of it. But once you do, you understand that it's pretty, uh, it's pretty much a easy concept. So it's nothing to worry about. But the only deal is that you have to do some problems for that. Okay. So now let's talk about what is a random variable. So a random, a random variable is nothing. It's pretty easy thing. Um, when I roll the exp so uh, your name is Nathan. Yeah. Uh, is that? Decent. Decent. Okay, so, so we have a Visante here, we have a Rajat here, we have a Nathan here. Whom am I missing? Jose. So let so probability so we all are studying in this classroom, so we are there are four people of us and all four of us are a part of a sample space inside this classroom. Whatever I do, choosing people among us, it's only going to be these people, okay? So now, suppose someone comes ahead and tells us that um, whoever's letter starts with R will get $100, okay? And whoever's name starts with V and N will only get $50. And whoever's name starts with J gets a million dollars. Okay. So how many people ended up with $50? Two people, right? How many people ended up with hundred dollars? One people. And how many people ended up with a million dollars? It's Joe. Joseph. It's only one people. Okay. So what did I do? I started with a sample space in which the outcomes were not digits. They were something we find in real world like the strings of names, right? Then what I did? I went ahead and I told you the definition of a particular experiment which I told that uh, based on the first letter of the word you are deciding what dollar amount to give to a particular person right so you are converting the name of a person which is the outcome of an experiment into a number okay so uh, and that number 
is denoting the, so if i think of this as a number so if i think of this as a x this x is the basically if i take one of the people among us as random um, then what is the dollars which he got okay so if i take myself at random then i get 100 dollars if i take both of us then two people get 50 dollars and one person gets a million dollars okay so what i am doing is that first first step i am given a sample space where the outcomes can need not be numbers they can be pretty much anything then i am defining a function which is converting the those outcomes into some numbers according to some logic so here the logic was i just pick up the two letters the first letter of the words and i put them together and i put them in front of a number okay and then i look at what is the possible values of that number so here the numbers definition was pick up the first two letters pick up the first letter of the word and then you assign them a particular dollar amount and then what is the possible dollar amounts which any of us could get we could have gotten three dollar amounts and uh, what is the probability that uh, any of us gets fifty dollars okay so it's like um, if i had chosen a person at random and given fifty dollars to him so then we were four people present in this room so i could have chosen Vishanti with a one by four probability, Jose with one by four, and Rajat with a one by four. So the people, uh, so if somebody came in the room and chose one of us at random, and they gave a particular dollar to us by looking at, so he, uh, the person comes, calls me, I go outside, he looks at my first name and gives me a dollar amount accordingly. So we are interested in knowing that uh, what is the probability that fifty dollars was given to a person. So what they do is that they look at Vasanthe and Nathan and they look, okay, that these two people are satisfying the criteria for $50. So what's the probability that I give a $50 amount to anyone? It's basically the probabilities of some of these two because these people are discrete in nature. So I could choose either of them with a quarter probability. So probability of getting a $50 amount is probability of choosing Vasanthe and Nathan, which is a half. And probability of getting of choosing Rajat is a quarter, and probability of choosing Jose is a quarter, right? So this is the entire expect. So this is the entire uh, way in which a random variable functions. You start with a sample space. You have the outcomes which we need not be the integers or any values, but probabilities can only make sense in values, right? So uh, you define a law and this law is basically called a mapping and that mapping is basically starting from Vasanthe, uh, it's basically converting the number, uh, the names into numbers and you look at the possible values of those numbers which that number could, which the dollar amount could take and you look at the relative probability distributions, okay. So it's nothing new it's just I took a subset of these two people I gave them a probability of half because I could add up these two things okay so uh, yeah so is this a discrete variable or a continuous variable so uh, do you understand what a random variable is so a random variable is a mapping from a sample space to a real line and in that real line it contains all the possible values which that particular random variable could take. In our case, the random variable was the number of dollar amounts which could be given to a person. This real line could take only three possible values, 50, 100 and a million dollars. And we map each of the elements of the sample space to whichever number it could have taken. So if either Vasanthe or Nathan could have chosen, so they could have ended up with 50 dollars. Uh, so we map each of the elements of the sample space to this line and then we are interested in knowing that out of each of these elements on the line what is the relative probabilities of their distribution. So uh, for a particular element whichever sample whichever elements in the sample space map to it the probabilities get added up okay and logically all the probabilities on the line should sum up to 1 because this sum of probabilities is nothing but the sum of these probabilities. It's essentially I'm just mapping these two onto only one and I'm increasing its probability 
instead of a quarter to half since two people are mapping and the other two people are having a one to one bijection with the real line okay so this is what a random variable is so you can think of a random variable as a discrete mapping which takes three values and you started with a sample space of four but you map it to three values on the line so four people were mapping to three lines to three points on a single line okay so yeah so uh, you can imagine that if i increase the number of people here to maybe a million and i give them the dollar amount let's say 50 50.1 so then instead of this being a discrete it will become a continuous case okay but we are talking about a simpler case right now uh, in which you are only talking about these cases so uh, right now uh, this thing is clear right so now i could argue one other thing on this so this was the first level of mapping right in which i started from a name converted it to a number next what i could do is i could i could build something on top of this function okay i could say all those people who got lesser than who got less than 1000 dollars are pretty poor, poor people and all the people who got above uh, thousand dollars are rich people okay so can you tell me like how many like what's the probability that some people are uh, poor or some people are rich so what i will do is i have two ways to look at this sample space so i will define this axis being whether the person is poor or rich right so this axis is a poor and rich and here i see that 50 uh, so people who got less than $1000 are people who got $50 and $100 right so these two these two points are mapping to this guy poor right and there is one guy who is mapping to the rich right so here the number of people so what is the probability that someone is poor it's nothing it's just probabilities of the people who got $50 which was half plus probability of people who got $100 which was a quarter right so the probability that there is a poor person among all of us four is is half plus one fourth which is a three quarter right and from here we can see that there is one person who is rich because he had gotten a thousand dollars and it maps directly to this line and what's the probability that uh, there is someone who got a million dollars it's one by fourth right so this this since it's a direct mapping it comes out to be a one fourth so you can see that if i define so first i built a sample space i converted it to a definition of a dollar and given many such things in which the dollar amounts are there and i know what is the probability of people who get a particular dollar amount i was able to define a new number whether the people were poor or rich and i had a threshold here and i just took the probabilities and aggregated them according to whether they were poor or rich okay so that is the thing that just think of this as a number line on which some of the probabilities of the sample space get mapped okay so once this this axis is done then you forget this thing and now what you can see is only three outcomes of values 50 100 and a million and these individual outcomes have probabilities half one fourth and one fourth respectively right and then this is the new sample space and you are making this mapping again okay so this is how uh, the random variables can function so i uh, so with respect to the original sample space I took the original outcomes, I mapped them once and then I mapped them again, right? So you can imagine that there is an infinite, there is an infinite depth to which all these outcomes could have been mapped, okay? So this is a random variable and then I applied some function on this random variable which was a function of a random variable, okay? And then I can apply it to again this. So the random variables can follow a because in nature okay so yeah 
So the broad thing to take from here is that do you guys understand what a random variable is? That you take the sample space, you map some of the possible outcomes and you have a mapping which converts the numbers or maybe tuple or something to a number. That rule was picking the elements by the first names and deciding on the dollar amounts. So it is a function between two sets. Yeah, it's a function which gives numerical value to elements of a set. And for a given numerical value, whichever elements of the set lie there, Does their values get added up. Uh, why does it have to be numerical? Like, uh, what? Why does it have to be numerical? <coughs> okay. Um, I'll like, come on that. I'll come on that. Okay. It need not be, but for the purpose of this case, assume it's numerical. I'll talk about it maybe after the lecture. Okay, you okay. keep that question with you. Okay, so any doubt before we proceed in this? Is there anything which is not clear in the definition of a random variable? Nathan? No. Seems pretty straightforward. Straightforward? So far. Okay. Cool. So now I am coming to the probability mass functions. So the probability mass functions are pretty much nothing, they are pretty easy. So sometimes what happens is that, for example, I tell you that I am tossing a dice. So you know that the probability the dice has the six faces, and I am looking at the top of the dice. Uh, so my my experiment. So when I roll a die, maybe that um, gives me a face, and my experiment is that I am looking at the topmost face. I am noting that down, noting down that number, and I am interested in looking at a graph which could tell me that these are the all possible uh, values which my dice could have given and this is the individual probability which that outcome could have yielded, right? So that is what is the probability mass function. So you can think of it like this. So suppose for a fair dice, the dice has six faces and uh, you are looking at the topmost face. So what is the value which the topmost face could take? it could take only six possible values, which is a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, a six, right? And each of the possible values at the top could occur with a probability of one over six, right? So this height denotes the probability of occurrence of a particular event. So this height has to be one over six. Similarly, for the second guy, this graph height has to be one over six. So you can imagine that uh, all of these six will give you six lines of one by six length uh, on a single graph. So the x-axis denotes the, all the possible outcomes of this graph, of this experiment. In our case, we rolled a dice. It gave us six numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six. So there are six discrete values on the x-axis which denote the numerical value whichever experiment yielded. For each numerical value, let's say for, uh, for getting the 3 on the top, we had the probability of 1 6. So the length of these bars denote the probability of all these events Simon, uh, which could occur. Okay, So this is essentially a picture, uh, if you look at this picture at a single time, you could say that okay, these 6 bars are equal in height and I can see 6, experiment, six things on the x-axis. So it's a dice having six outcomes and all of the heights are equal. So it is pretty much a fair dice, okay? And you can also say that since this is giving you the height of a, this is giving you the probability of a single event. So the sum of these heights should be one, right? Because each of the heights is giving you the probability of a single outcome and probability of occurrence of all the outcomes has to be one by the uh, law which we talked in the first class. So this is the property of the bar graph that the height has to be one. So if someone went ahead and gave you a biased dice, a biased dice may be which turns up three more times, more frequently than six, then its graph will start looking something like, you take a one, take two, take three, take four, take five, take six, maybe this height goes on till three quarters and then the one quarter gets 
distributed to all these other things. So this probability goes up and other probabilities go down. Okay, But the sum of all these still has to be 1. Okay, So this is what's probability mass function. X axis denotes the numerical value of the experiment. Y axis denotes the probability of occurrence of each numerical outcome. So now I am going to talk about a simple case which we have already discussed earlier and uh, let's try to find its P uh, so this thing is known as probability mass function why this thing appears to be a mass right a cream cheese of length of volume 1 by 6 which is sitting on this this is also sitting so this is a mass which is sitting at individual points there so between 1 and 2 this mass is 0 like right? uh, dice cannot take a value 1.1 or 1.2 so that's why it's mass mass always sits like this chair is sitting at a particular place. The gap between chairs can't be filled by another chair. So that's why this is mass. So probability mass functions only make sense for discrete cases where like you draw a die so you know that there are only six possible outcomes which you could get. Okay? There is a suitable analog for this in continuous case which I don't want to introduce right now because it will confuse you guys. Okay? Yeah. So uh, let's talk about a simpler uh, mass function which I, so it's already 810. Do you want to maybe go on for 10 more minutes and then we wrap up? Sure. All right. So um, I have given you an example that you had a die, you had a coin and you toss that coin many times until you get a heads. So you, uh, the, this was the game which we played earlier that we started with a coin we, and that coin is a fair coin and we are counting the number of times till which we get a head. So suppose we get a head in first times then we are good to go but suppose I toss it once and I get a tail and then I toss it again then I get a heads. So uh, I am making two tosses here. So I am interested in, no in noticing that how many tosses of a coin do I need to make until I get a heads okay so you can imagine that if you are given a uh, so if you are waiting for heads to come up there might be a situation in which maybe you roll a million times tails and then maybe you get a head in last it might possible it might be possible although that thing might have very low probability but it still will be possible so this is an experiment where there are infinite where there are infinite possible outcomes for example uh, so, so you are rolling the coin until you get a head. Suppose you roll it first time. So uh, you are counting the number of tosses you are making. So suppose you roll it, um, the head in first times. So then you are only making first toss, one toss, right? Suppose you don't get heads in first time, you get a tail but you end up with a head second time. So you may, you have to make two tosses in that case. And it might be possible that you end up with a head in the third toss, right? So here you are making three tosses. So it might be possible yet maybe you make five tosses, you make six tosses and you end up with a head in the seventh toss. So here you make seven tosses, right? So you can see that the tails are having a continuous, so tails can continue till infinity and maybe at infinity plus one you get a heads, okay? So we are interested in finding probability of this, okay? So let's say that uh, we made n tosses, okay? So let's say that we made n tosses. So n tosses means that I rolled a tails in n minus 1 tosses and I rolled a heads in the nth toss, right? So it means that I rolled a tails in n minus 1 tosses and I rolled a heads in the last nth toss, right? So what's the probability of rolling n minus 1 tails? So if my head rolls uh, with the probability p it rolls a head and with the probability 1 minus p it rolls a tail in a single toss then probability of rolling n minus 1 tails is equivalent to probability of rolling this as tails multiplied by rolling this as tails multiplied by rolling this as tails right because the individual tosses are independent so probability of rolling a tails is 1 minus p times 1 minus p times 1 minus p so on till n minus 1 times right and then at the nth toss, you are getting a heads, which is a single factor of p. So you can see that this factor, 
comes out to be 1 minus p raised to the power n minus 1 times p. Okay, you see this, right? So now um, this is what is a geometric variable where you keep on trying to do an experiment until you get a success. So the best way to understand a graduate experiment is why you apply for graduate schools. You keep on applying until you get admitted to one. So uh, this is what a graduate, sorry, this is what a geometry variable. So graduate school is equal to G, so G for G. That's the way to remember it. So um, if you look at this, this has infinite outcomes, but at least you have to toss ahead one. So this outcome stand, start with one, right? So the so if I draw a PMF of this, so what are the number of possible tosses I could make? I could make a toss one, I could make two, I could make three, so on I could make infinite tosses, but the gap between two tosses still has to be one, okay? And now, here if I put n as one, this comes out to be one minus p raised to the power zero, one minus one zero, and it comes out to be p, right? So this comes out to be a p, and then if I put n as one, it comes out to be uh, if I put n as 2, it comes out to be 1 minus p. At n equal to 2, it comes out to be 1 minus p times p. So you can see that p has got to multiplied by 1 minus p. Right? So it, it will be slightly smaller than this, p times 1 minus p. And then there is something which is smaller than this, p times 1 minus p squared. Okay. So you can see that this series is a continuous decreasing series of PMFs in which it continues till infinity, but the multiplication factor is one minus p. Okay, so this is an example of a geometric PMF where the length of the bars will still sum up to one, but there are infinite such bars, and each of the bars length is decreasing, and since the length is also decreasing, and since the number of tosses are also infinite, they will still sum up to one in infinity of in the limit of infinity. So if you take this geometric series and the p has to be less than 1, then um, if you sum up the series using a normal summation formula of geometric variable, then it should sum up to 1, right? And that is one of the case where I don't need linear algebra, where I don't need mathematics. I could just say these are coins, probabilities are decreasing and they have to sum up to 1 by probability law. So this sum has to be 1. So I don't need to do all that complex mathematics of taking a a r squared a r cube and then a r is to power n minus 1 upon r minus 1 dividing by r and then putting n as infinity and then finding for answer to be 1. This is pretty much that. Okay. So this is how probabilities make sense in real world. So are you guys clear with what a geometric PMF is? And the reason geometric PMF is, is uh, important in real world is because when you're building AI system, sometimes we keep on doing trials until we'll succeed. Okay, and just one last slide. So this is pretty much easy. I I won't eat much of your head right now. Um, so I had told you that this is a, just a practice of random variables. So let's say that I rolled a dice twice. I had a four-sided die. I rolled it twice. So you have seen this figure before. This figure is not pretty new to you. So now the outcome you get in this experiment at a particular moment is not a number, right? When I roll a die two times, I don't get a number. I get a sam I get a list of numbers in a sample space. So the idea is like when I roll a dice. When I roll a four-sided die two times, uh, two times, then I can get an outcome as one one. I can get it as one two. I can get it as one three, and so on till two, so on till four four. Right? I can get all these outcomes. Each of these outcomes has a probability of one over sixteen. This is how your sample space looks like right now. So this is not a number right now. Okay? This is just a list and it has a probability associated with it. And now somebody is telling you that the rule to get the number from these outcomes is to just look at the minimum of the two rules which you rolled. Okay, and what's the probability that that, so what's, uh, if you take the minimum of two rules, 
So first roll can roll anything between one and four. The second roll can roll anything between one and four. And if I look at the minimum of those, it can be anything from one to four, right? So this x can take any of the values from one to four. And I'm interested in knowing that which are all the possible outcomes which are yielding me a value of two. Okay. So in that case, what will happen is that these possible outcomes, these all outcomes will have a minimum value of 2 among them. So you can see 2, 2 is giving me 1, 2 and 3 is giving me 1, right? Is giving me 2 as minimum value. So all these outcomes are getting are giving me a value of 2, right? So all 5 of these outcomes are getting mapped to a value of 2 in this x. Okay? Because the minimum of the two rows in all either of five of these is two. So you can just add up their individual probabilities, which is nothing but one over 16 times five, which is five over 16. Okay, so this is how I went from a list using a rule to a number which was two, and I counted five of individual experiments, five of individual outcomes, and I added up their numbers. So the answer for this case would have been just a simple 5 over 16, okay? So this is how the uh, random variables appear. You have, a, you have a collection, you have a law which converts them to numbers, all the elements of collection which convert to a particular, which map to a particular number, you calculate the probability of the, that number by adding up the individual probabilities. So that's how the random variable functions in a fundamental sense and thank you. Uh, yeah, I think we are good for today. Okay, uh, there are some stuff left, but I don't think, I think we already exceeded the time.